Hi, welcome to the briefing on your service learning engagement. You will be engaging foreign workers at Sungai Tengah Lodge and through this activity, we hope that you can understand how mental health is an essential cog in the healthcare system. Let's do a little revision. The first revision will be of this theory that you have encountered in your behavioral science module. It's the biopsychosocial model of health. There are three things that we need to look at. The first thing is the biomedical model of which this looks at the medical aspects of health, including physiological, as well as infectious diseases, as well as chronic diseases. But on its own, it's not going to be essential to understand the human being. So we need to also then look at the sociological health, which is basically how does the individual function in a society, how well supported or how well accepted the individual is from the place in which he or she is living in. So that's the sociological aspect. And in particular, with reference to your class, mental health, there is the component of the psychological health huh? and in, of which this mental health comes into question and we will touch a little bit about how stress plays a part in affecting the mental health of each individual. First up, biomedical health. It's a no-brainer, but we still need to be reminded that everyone wants to be healthy medically, right? But on its own, and you can see why the biopsychosocial model is useful, because even though we want to be healthy medically, our lack of mental health, for instance, stress and other kind of anxiety may then lead us to deprioritize our medical health. And therefore, lack of medic mental health affects our medical health. And we may want to be healthy, but if we are an unwanted immigrant, such as a foreign worker holding a work permit in Singapore, the lack of integration to society through access to the medical network may also create a lot of barriers in us being able to be medically healthy. Okay, so it's not so simple to just see your patient as someone whether or not he or she has an illness. We should also look at what might be preventing our future patients from being healthy. And to understand why they cannot be medically healthy, let's look at the next aspect of the biopsychosocial model, social health. But prior to that, let's look at some statistics showing how the foreign workers may be at risk at the biomedical health aspects for the simple reasons is they typically work in the most dangerous and the physically toughest job that Singaporeans may not want to work in and you can see from the statistics that typically in a year if you count total injuries there are about 22,787 cases in 2023 alone and these numbers may be significantly higher for the simple reason and we will talk about this later in the social health that the employers may not want to have such negative statistics. Okay, so obviously, by virtue of the kind of work they work in, they are at risk. Second sphere of the biopsychosocial model, sociological health. Everyone wants to be part of a community, and if they are accepted, they've got good sociological health. Huh? But Quite often, immigrant workers, particularly those occupying the least prestigious jobs, are often seen as unwanted immigrant. And so therefore, because they're seen as unwanted immigrant, you will find that there is a general lack of desire by the society, such as a place like Singapore, to properly integrate them. This would then affect something called mental health because it will create a lot of obstacles for the foreign workers, which then would then impact on their 
mental health state. Uh, they will be exposed to stress ranging from financial to physical living arrangement, for example. Uh, we'll look at this a bit later. And more importantly, because they are seen as unwanted immigrant, they are often prevented from overcrowding our healthcare system, which also means that there are certain barriers and obstacles set up for them to be able to access our medical health. And that then, of course, will impact on their medical health sphere. The barriers set up by society in this aspect of the sociological health may also limit the ability of the foreign workers if they are ill or if they have accident or in the case of an infectious disease such as COVID-19 for accessing the healthcare. As a result, you'll find that the barrier set up may then create problems for the foreign workers when they are ill. Huh? And this can be seen to a certain extent by COVID-19 in the first year alone 95% of all COVID-19 infection in Singapore comes from foreign workers living in the dormitory. Yeah? More on this in the next slide. One of the hallmarks of sociological health is something called social integration. Yeah? And for this, let's look at population density and access to society. Now, assuming that we live in Marine Parade GRC in the constituency of Marine Parade, Singapore is pretty crowded. So you find that within the Marine Parade constituency inside Marine Parade GRC, there are about 46,400 people living in that constituency alone and they are distributed into about 58 blocks of HDB flats. Um, if you look at average, Household size, your pop living density is probably not more than four or five per flat. Okay, in fact, a lot might be three, a parent and a child, or in the case of myself and my wife, um, we don't have kids, so it's two to a flat. Huh? So, population density is still quite good within your living spaces. However, that is true of permanent residents and citizens, but when it comes to foreign workers, our society sometimes, intentionally or unintentionally, practice something called segregation, which means that we do not quite like them entering our society. So we tend to house them in so-called foreign workers dormitory, which is a form of containment. Now, the place that you will be visiting for your service learning is a place called Sunai Tengah Lodge. There are 25,000 foreign workers living in a space which is roughly about a square kilometers or two square kilometers. And all 25,000 workers are living in 10 blocks of 13 stories flat, huh? 10 blocks. So if you look at the comparison between Marine Parade, 46,400 spread over 58 blocks, versus 25,000 um, packed into 10 blocks, quite often 12 to a room without toilets. Huh? They are only starting to build on suite toilet for each dorm, primarily because of COVID-19. Remember COVID-19 and the statistics I gave you earlier? The reason why the virus or an infectious disease can spread very fast in the dormitory was because of population density and lack of access to segregated or reasonable toilet facilities. Okay, so sociological health creates impact on psychological health, which we'll talk about in the next line, which is more relevant to a certain extent to what you're studying now. And it ultimately will cause a negative impact on medical health. Huh? So you, you can see from this learning point, no matter how well Singapore protects itself in terms of its public health, if our sociology or the society is managed in an unequal way, you will find that the illness, in this case, an infectious disease like COVID-19, then enters our society and challenges our medical health system through the most vulnerable population in our society, in this case, 
um, the foreign workers living in dormitories such as Sungai Tengah Lodge. And the last aspect of the biopsychosocial model is psychological health. Eh? And in this case, specifically in terms of your class, at least part of half of your class is dedicated towards looking at mental health. Eh? Mental health is mental wellness. You know, we want a little bit of stress because stress is essential for us to motivate us, but too much stress would then create a problem of us not prioritizing health because our mind would want to prioritize and escape from the stress or the anxiety or the depression that we're feeling over something called medical health. Okay. Now, in the case of the foreign workers, you'll find that so much obstacle is placed before them in terms of accessing medical health. Some of them may suffer painful injuries, um, but they are denied from accessing the healthcare, which also means that they often have work at very physically demanding jobs through pain and injuries, which then create a lot of emotional stress. And you see the lack of medical health then create an impact on the mental health. The inability of having work-life balance because quite often the foreign workers and you may find out in your conversations with them in your service learning results in that the bulk of the work week for the foreign workers maybe up to six and a half days sometimes are spent working and when they are not working they have very limited downtime and when they have limited downtime they then have limited access to enter society not that it is that easy for them to enter society if you look back towards the sociological health the dormitories are often built very far away from the city centre so that it costs a lot to enter the society and even if they eventually get to city centres they may stay away from the places that Singaporeans hang out because they would perceive a lack of as a welcome or acceptance by society for them to enter it. So as a result, you will find that in terms of psychological health, they will stick amongst themselves. They will stick to certain places they feel that will be more welcoming of them. And that, as a result, what we're seeing in Singapore is that you will sometimes see the creation of places like Little India, Little Myanmar, Little Indonesia, Little Philippines, etc, etc. And on those Sundays, the locals don't enter those areas because it is see that, that those areas are the foreign workers. Huh? And you'll find that that limited access of that half day to meet friends or the limited geography where they can only go from the dorm to one specific spot and there's no true freedom that may have an impact on mental health because of the lack of what we call social integration or in the biopsychosocial model we look at something called social health okay so each of these things will have an impact as well huh? now let's look a little bit at this thing called stress huh? so one of the key threats of course to mental health is stress and let's look at how health help or what the site teach us about what are the external contributors to stress. Okay, The first is of course personal problems and now personal problems refers to people to people problem or any problem that is unique to the individual. Huh? Now in your engagement with the foreign workers one of the most valuable things is you get to see where they live and you will find that that whole environment is right for creating personal problem because you're looking at um, 12 people living in a room you may have up to about a few hundred people each floor um, that shared maybe a limited number of toilets so you'll find it a lot of personal problems in terms of personal space um, people from different culture thrown into the same dorm etc etc so those categories are called personal problems work related problems um, worries about the demands from the employers, worries about how if even if I'm on MC, I may be fined in something called a no-show penalty. Um, so despite the fact that I have an MC, I might feel, uh, face a financial penalty if I um, don't show up for work. Huh? 
work problems. This, by the way, is one of the key reasons behind the fact that a lot of foreign workers choose to work even though they might be COVID positive. Huh? A lot of people say, oh, the foreign workers are irresponsible during that period of time. What a lot of Singaporeans don't know is that if they don't show up for work, they don't get paid. And not only do they not get paid, they also sometimes get fined. Relationship issues, so this could be them and their employers, it could be them between the dorm mates, as just now previously mentioned, in work and in personal problems. This could also be their relationships with their family members who are half the world away, or at least six hours away by air, etc, etc. And every financial worker, Singapore represents a dream, but this dream is pretty costly. Quite often, the foreign workers have to pay something called a recruitment fee to be able to get a job in Singapore. And the recruitment fee typically is somewhere between 8 to 10 months worth of salary. It can even reach about 12 months. Now, if you look at a work permit contract, which means that quite often for a lot of the newcomers coming to Singapore if they, on their first contract, up to 12 months they might be working without salary yeah typically their average work day um they'll work more than 12 hours even though legally 12 hours is the maximum we can work but because they need to repay this thing called a financial debt they will have to do overtime and in their normal working hours which is that eight hours we considered as legal working hours the foreign workers get paid roughly around $17 a day. It's only with overtime that they can hit about $20 to $25 or even $30. Okay, so the fear of not being able to repay the debt creates a fair amount of stress which makes them deprioritize their uh, medical health and their uh, mental health. Yeah. health problems, so this could be existing injuries, this could be flu, and because of the fear of the loss of finance, they would then downplay the health problems, some uh, medical non-compliance in some ways. They have to work, They even though they are ill, because they are worried that if they don't, they might be um, negatively viewed by their employers, and if they are sacked by their employers, they lose their work permit visa, which means they will be deported back home. Huh? Unlike the rest of us, the foreign workers cannot resign from an unreasonable company because their company is the only reasons be that they can stay in Singapore because of this thing called the work permit visa. It is linked to the employer. So in other words, the employer can fire an employee, an employee cannot resign because the minute they resign, they will have to be sent home, which then means that they cannot earn money for their family. Well, they're stuck far away from their loved ones. Things can happen back home. And if things happen back home, um, such as the loss of a older relative, or in the cases these days because of global warming, loss of floods in places like India, Bangladesh, um, or Myanmar and Philippines because of monsoon, etc., etc., you will find that even if something happens, they are stuck here. They can't go home because um, while they have annual leave, it is not that simple to apply for leave to go back because of the financial situation. So you see, everything is kind of connected. Huh? So that can be a significant um, contributor to the stress. There could be unexpected news and if you look at Bangladesh as an example, in 2024, there were a lot of political protests and in the political protests, initially, lots of people who are pro protesting against corruption face a brutal crackdown by the then government and a lot of people were killed huh? who were, when they are protesting against that government. It's only when the government resigned and were toppled that things could go well. So you can see that the unexpected news here could be political instability and this could link to things such as losses or bereavement if their relatives are caught up in such stuff. Or it could be 
an unexpected uh, monsoon that is more severe than whatever or it could be the unexpected news of um, a sudden need for um, um, operation and this then links to financial crisis okay last thing would be the daily hassles um, when you meet the foreign workers ask them about their daily life huh? typically um, they get up around 4 5 a.m um, they have to get ready the lorries or transport will pick them up and drop them off at your workplace because Sunai Tengah Lodge is quite far away and their place of work may be very far away and typically sometimes the lorry will drop them at different parts of the island so typically they may start and set off for work two hours before the actual work time and when they get off work or stop work around six or seven you may find that um, it takes up to one two hours for the lorries to pick them up and drop them back at the dorm so you're essentially looking at someone who possibly will wake up around 5 6 a.m um, and won't get to sleep until about 10 11 12 o'clock so you're looking at possibly an average sleep time of maybe about less than five hours okay again final for foreign workers um, and see what kind of daily life they have that will consider things such as daily hassles huh? and all these of course have enormous impact on something called mental health huh? because it uh, impact on all three biopsychosocial sphere okay so psychological health a little bit of revision there so what have we learned so far Perfect health is not necessarily the perfect state if you just only see things from the medical health point of view. Huh? We have to and we must consider mental wellness and sociological inclusivity as essential. Okay, So from the discussion just now, you know that we may have the best medical system. But if the people who are discriminated do not have access to the medical system, then you now have a problem, right? The best system in the world cannot help someone if that someone is shut out from it. So that's sociological inclusivity. If the person is so frightened of the lack of money, if you look at the person who is so worried about the loss of a job, then the person is not going to prioritize medical health. They're going to prioritize work. They're going to prioritize um money or the earning of their salary because they have to repay back the loan they've got family waiting for them for the money back home okay one of the key things that you want to then bring and continue to learn as you evolve into healthcare professional future superheroes without cape is that anytime you encounter a patient that is medically non-compliant the first thing we must do is not to assign blame we should suspend judgment and we should look deeper in order to have an understanding and one of the key things that you will have that service learning will help you to slowly acquire is something called empathy so once you have empathy then you start to look at things slightly differently yeah now remember earlier i said Stress is not evil. We do need stress to motivate us. So if you look at the green part of this chart, see, if we don't have stress, we're in the little blue section of the stress curve. Huh? We're like, hey, you know. I'm... So to use the example of you as a student, right? So if, for instance, um, your tutor tells you, whatever you do, you're going to get an A. No stress, right? Because you're still going to get excellent grade and so therefore you're not going to study you're not going to do your homework because your a is guaranteed too little stress psychological term under load no motivation to work no motivation to work your performance will suffer huh? because everything will be pushed aside so you need a little bit of stress and the little bit of stress comes with this thing called grading if you don't study you may fail if you fail, you may have to repeat. If you don't go for university, you don't study, you may not get an A. 
if you don't get an A, you get a D, your GPA suffers, and therefore that fear, the little bit of stress, then what pushes us to then say, okay, let's study, let's work hard. Okay, so that's the green part. But if you look at the bell curve, right at the top is something called the fatigue point. And if you go past the fatigue point, it means overloading, which is the yellow section. Yellow section, we still can function, but we're starting to have something called burnout. Huh? Okay, I'm studying too much. Oh, I can't, my brain cannot absorb anymore. So exhaustion starts to come in. That section, we are starting to work less efficiently. We, we will still achieve, but we are now in a so-called deficit state. When you are in an extreme stress situation, working 12, 14 hours a day, five hours of sleep, fears about financial status, you are in the red zone, which is the burnout or the extreme stress state, anxiety, panic, and anger. At this stage, your performance simply cannot work. Huh? So you'll find that you may be producing, but you're not producing meaningful stuff. Now, if you look at maybe in terms of performance, rather not in terms of work, but performance in terms of management of health, you will find that in the yellow and red zone is where most likely medical non-compliance will come in. Huh? Because everything else will take priority over the healthcare state. Okay, so this is why it is important for student nurses to understand this thing called mental health. Huh? Because the mental health really is pretty much the same story when we are trying to help a patient battle medical health. That's why as early as year one, you're introduced to something called the biopsychosocial model. In most classes, we tend to do classroom learning, but there is a limit to classroom learning. Theories are useful, but theories doesn't really expose you to reality. Yeah? This is a picture of the place that you visit, or this is the place of visit in your service learning. Each of those colored blocks are known as a cluster. There is a football field, um, and below there's a car park. You look at the lorries. The lorries are not for just for transporting goods. Huh? The lorries quite often are for transporting human beings. So you'll find again under daily hassles, under other kinds of stress, psychological health and sociological health are affected just simply by the mode of transport. Okay. Each of those clusters have got two blocks and each of the two blocks house 5,000 people. Huh? And each of those windows you see, or if each window is one unit, you'll see about 12 people inside each of those windows, the stretch of windows, and there's no toilet inside. They're only starting to build on sweet toilet because of COVID. Okay, so some of these things do take note, do find out, do clarify, do investigate through your conversations with the foreign workers. Eh? You're not just there to do what we call a medical screening. You're there to try to find out a little bit more to understand this group of people who may represent up to about 25% of your future patient, if not 30%. Okay, this is Sungai Tana Lodge. The concept of service learning is that you learn through the service of others. That means you are not there simply to just help the foreign workers because a medical screening may not help them because them understanding they've got diabetes or hypertension may not help them because they may still have very little access to the chronic illness management. So therefore, while you allow Salvation Army our kind host to intervene and provide much needed medical intervention, the foreign workers' life is still going to be one that is fairly challenging. Okay? So, in other words, therefore, you're not there just to help Salvation Army Sojourn Program. 
you are also there to help yourself to learn. And how do you learn? You learn from the foreign workers whom you are serving. Learn to have conversations, okay? Talk to them. Ask them about their daily life. Ask them about their hopes and dreams. Ask them about life in Singapore, okay? Don't ask them about their medical knowledge. Provide the medical knowledge, but listen to their response to understand why do they deprioritize the medicine? Is it because in under the biopsychosocial model, they are not ignorant in the biomedical, but simply because they are too stressed in the psychological and the sociological for them to want to do something about the biomedical. Okay, so this concept of seeing things from your patient's point of view, in this case, the foreign workers, is what we call empathy. Your service learning is linked to an assignment, as I understand from your lecturer, and so you're using something called the deal structure. Okay, so you may have already been briefed in class, but let's do a slight refresher. What is the deal with deal? Okay, it is basically an acronym for three areas or three ways to look at your learning. The first part is description, and the second part is analysis called examination, and the last part is to link what you see and learn to what was learned in the classroom through your theory. Now, this then provides us this structure for us to reflect on our learning so that we can maximize our, our growth as a human being. Okay, so that is the deal structure. And so for you to just write the reflection, so let's go look at these three aspects of the learning huh? and see how what kind of conversations you can create to help you come up with the reflection you need to help yourself learn. First one is the easiest. Describe. Recall objectively your experience. Huh? Here you want to focus on the what the heck moments. In other words, things that surprise you, things that shock you, things that un they are unexpected. Okay, so in other words, focus on information, observations that are surprising, shocking, puzzling, frustrating, or more importantly, illustrative of the difference between you, particularly if you're Singaporeans and PR, the more privileged group people of Singaporean society and the ones you serve were less privileged foreign workers on work permit who are not expected and not wanted to become citizens. Okay? Describe. And how do you describe? You describe different things from the dorms, the whole environment of the dorms to the inaccessibility of dorm. Up to you. Describe. At this part, you're not analyzing, you're just looking at things that surprised you. The deeper part of the learning comes in part two of the deal structure, which means the EAL part of the deal structure. And under examination is where you start to then look at the what the heck moments to try and understand a little bit deeper. And here you Examine from a personal point of view and you examine from a civic or a social point of view. That means personal point of view, where, how do I contribute? What did I do wrong? What did I do well? Etc, etc. Society, where did society go wrong? Were there discrimination involved? Were there racism involved? Did society do the right thing to support society? And the last part that links a service learning experience to the classroom is something called academic point of view, which means that what were the theories that you learned in MHNPC on mental health, mental wellness, and how does those theories help you understand the foreign workers? So a foreign worker says, oh, life is very good here. I like Singapore very good because they want to be polite to us, they don't want to hurt us or insult us, the citizens. But can we hear between the lines that they are, what they are describing will constitute 
threats to their mental, uh, mental healthness? Did the theory help you understand? And if the theory didn't help you understand, how do you improve your application of the theory in order to help you understand? So, civic, personal, academic. Yeah? Three different ways to examine in the examine part of the deal structure. So, under the examine part, when you're looking at personal, you're looking at feelings to frame your learning. Huh? So, what kind of feelings? You can, for instance, focus on how did I feel seeing the dorm and the foreign workers in the first couple of minutes, first contact point, okay? And did your feelings change? These are examples. Huh? Feel free to use anything that you want to come up with. Now, why do you want to look at the before after because before you see it you may have certain stereotype or assumptions about foreign workers and the dormitory at first glance if you look at a picture just now it may look like a very nice place until you start to hear more about it so your first thought might be hey singapore is quite good now we built such nice dormitory for the foreign workers but after conversations with the foreign workers maybe your feelings will change how does it change it's like hmm it looks nice but is the whole place built not to keep people out, but to keep people in? So remember, in Singapore, we have two types of housing. We have HDB and we have um, condos. Huh? More on this later when we look at civic. Huh? So did the feelings change? If the feelings change, talk about it. Because when your feelings change, learning has occurred. And therefore, there's something that you can put in inside the deal structure work that will help you get your B plus, your A's. Huh? And remember earlier, we talked about assumptions. What are my stereotypes of foreign workers? What are my views of them? And have these assumptions changed after I had conversations with them, after I've talked to them? And more important, importantly, in your deals reflection, you might want to talk a little bit about how, whether I like the experience or not, I may have grown or benefited as a person and if I haven't, talk about why you haven't and how to improve. Okay, personal. Let's look at the next part of the deal which is the civic or a critical analysis of our society. And here, the questions you may want to think about is where our society may have messed up and we need to know this so that we can improve. Okay, so here focus on things such as your medical screening. As part of someone who's trained with amazing skills to help save life or improve life, me just working in a hospital, would that help improve foreign workers' life? And in your conversation with the foreign workers, how likely or how accessible is a foreign worker living in a dormitory being able to visit you in any form of healthcare institution, be it a hospital or a clinic, okay? So here you can talk about how can we do more as part of society? In this case, you as a future superhero without cape. And we talk about the gaps and weakness of our society in treatment of foreign workers. Remember just now I talked about, and I asked the question, is the dormitory built to keep people in? And I mentioned that we have two types of housing in Singapore, public housing, the HDBs, and then the condos. And in the condos, you also see fences, you also see security guards. But condos are exclusive place. The walls and security guard is set up to keep people out. You unwanted strangers, try not to come in. This is expensive place and we pay for the exclusivity. But in a dormitory, slightly different. Huh? Notice where the dorm dormitories are situated, typically far away from HDB or residential estates, certainly not next to a condo. And then you start to look at the security guard. Huh? Is it to keep people out or is it to keep the foreign workers in so that build the supermarket, build the basketball court, build everything within the dormitory so that in the hope that they will not enter our society so that the greater Singapore society may complain about them. Is this a gap? Is this a weakness? 
stuff for us to think about uh, in under the examine part of the civic part. Where are society's weakness and how can we improve? And here we look at this thing called public health. A dormitory may seem to be a very good solution to house the foreign workers and set them apart or keep them separated from the society. But in the kind of living arrangements that you witness, is there a weakness there? Is there an Achilles heel? Will the illness enter our society through the overcrowded dormitory? Questions for you to look at, think about and put inside your due reflection. And I guess this is similar to point number one. As a future lifesaver, you have great potential to do good for society. How can you help to build a better society? And if we forget about the whole notion of job and profession, what are some of the attitudes I have towards foreign workers that are negative? that may have contributed to the way they are treated. So in this context, regardless of whichever jobs we're in, can I change the way I think about foreign workers? And if I change the way I think about foreign workers to a more positive point, can this then indirectly, in the next generation of Singaporeans, lead to better treatment of them, better acceptance of them? A society is like an ocean and if there's enough drops of individuals, that drops of individual collectively will form that ocean. So you want to change, you have to be part of the tides of change. And ultimately, we work very hard to try and get you into a dormitory, not an easy place to get in, both in terms of transportation and in terms of security because we want you to have strong, powerful learning. And so you are one of the few who are privileged. You may not see it, but you are actually privileged enough to enter a dormitory to observe and to learn. So how does the foreign workers dormitory in a place like Sungai Tengah Lodge teach us about Singapore's hidden discrimination? The last part of investigating your experience is to link the service learning back to the theories inside your classroom. Huh? What did you learn about the threats to mental health specifically on where we live, work and play from visiting the dormitory by putting ourselves in the shoes of the foreign workers? What kind of theories did you find useful that you were taught before the experience? or that you will encounter after the service learning experience that will help you understand a human being better in terms of trying to understand your mental health. And what are some of the gaps between learning in the classroom and in real life, such as the service learning that may occur? And how can you as a learner actively try and overcome those gaps huh? because each of your lecturers may teach upwards to 60, 90 or even 100 students in different classes. They might not be able to help you even if they truly wanted to. So sometimes the learner may have to take responsibility and so in this particular case, how do you address the gap? How do you make sense of the theories? How do you build on the theory so that in the future, if you do become a teacher, you create new theories? What are the gaps? Okay. And through that, this is the key thing you may want to look at is how can you drive your own learning? Okay. That's why we have service learning, right? So that each of you can learn at your own pace and hopefully it becomes a little bit easier for you when you want to save life because you can now understand your patient at least a little bit from their point of view and not through our wrong 
assumptions about them. The last part is to the application, articulate learning. Okay, in this case, you're asked to build on your experience. Okay, what did I learn? Specifically, how did I learn it? And why is this learning matter? Why is it important? Why do we need to have service learning? Why do we need to go to a dormitory? Why can't we just do it in a classroom? And because I'm there at a dormitory, I may have seen things I couldn't see in a classroom. What kind of things I can build upon this? My future patients were foreign workers. How does this benefit me then? What goal should I set in order to improve myself and the quality of my learning or the quality of my future? I, whether as a nurse, and if you don't want to become a nurse, as a Singaporean, because one of the key things we talked about earlier was this, right? We have the best healthcare system, but if one segment of our society is unprotected, and this is proven by COVID-19, Singapore will still enter a lockdown if too many of our foreign workers come down with COVID-19 through the living condition in the dormitory. How do we improve? In any case, whether you are looking forward to it or not, the Salvation Army and the School of Health Sciences, Nihon Polytechnic, wish you a fruitful learning journey in your service learning engagement. This presentation is brought to you by the School of Health Sciences and Nihon Polytechnic and Salvation Army, the Sojourn Program. Salvation Army is an amazing organization that does a lot of charitable work for all segments of population, but perhaps one of their key section is to look after the ones without a lot of legal rights and these are the foreign workers that society do not want. Bye!